We're very glad to welcome you one and all. I think you know there's been a new member added to the congregation uh, this week. My name is Sienna and it's just possible that you'll see Mum and Dad and maybe even Sienna in a matter of minutes. They were hoping to come. Let's have a prayer. Lord, we pray you'll bless that family and that new little lady, Sienna. Grant a good health and appearance too and condescend to meet with us and to bless us for Christ's sake. Amen. Now the Apostle Paul once said, when you read you'll understand. But a lot of things that most of us like to do apart from reading. But reading is very important. And the most profound book that's ever been written is what we're going to look at today. It's been called the most wonderful book in the world. It's written by John, who was the nearest to Christ. The youngest, probably, of the disciples. The only one at the cross... You have to ask, where were the others? Well, they were hiding. They were hiding. But John was there at the cross, and to him our Lord entrusted his mother. John's Gospel is very different to Matthew, Mark and Luke. In Matthew, Mark and Luke, we see the human breadth of the Messiah. In John's Gospel, we see the divine depth. In Matthew, Mark and Luke, we're following Jesus as he goes around doing good, but in John's Gospel, we're often at his feet listening to him talk. By the way, uh, Mum and Dad are just coming in, and I can't see Sierra yet. Uh, see any yet. Maybe she's not here. Come on, Jill, bring her in. Hello, Tammy. <laughs> it's been said about John's Gospel that a child can wade in it and an elephant can swim in it. So that gives you some idea of what sort of a book John's Gospel is. And I would challenge you sometime to sit down and read it through. You can read it through in about an hour and it can change your life. Preferably begin with a modern translation, but any translation will actually do. Would you look with me, please, at the opening verses? <coughs> John's Gospel. Matthew had presented Christ as the king, king of the Jews. Mark had presented him as the servant of mankind. Luke as the universal son of man. Now John will present him as the son of God. By the way, that's how we usually come to Christ. We're glad to see you, Caroline. Welcome. And Dad's there too, Duncan. Good to see you, Cedric. Both of you. When we first hear of Christ, we hear of him as a king. And that doesn't always go down well because we don't like taking orders. So that's Matthew's Gospel. We're introduced to Christ the King. In Mark, we suddenly learn that he was a servant, that he took our nature... And he said, I'm among you as one that serves. And that's quite a shock. Then in Luke, we discover he's a man just like us and yet not like us. He's as much God as though not at all man and he's as much man as though not at all God. So in Luke, we see that he is the universal son of man, our brother, our friend. But John's Gospel presents him as God. Look please at the opening verses. John chapter 1. This is the book where a child may wade and an elephant may swim. In the beginning, that's the way the Bible began. So this is telling us about a new creation accomplished by the same one who did the old creation. About seven times the New Testament tells us it was Christ who created the world. He's the creator of sun, moon and stars. Now he begins the new creation whereby we might have a new life that will reach into eternity. And we need it because we're all dying. No sooner are born, we begin to go downhill. In the beginning was the Word. That's a great name for Christ. He's God's thoughts made audible. There is no question that humans can raise more important than is there a God and if there is, what is he like? No question has more profound width, height, depth and length 
than that question. On it, everything depends. Suppose God was a cruel ogre who delighted in persecuting us. Life would hardly be worth living. And when we were in trouble, we wouldn't know what to do. But to find out that God is a loving Heavenly Father, to read about Christ, <coughs> this man receiveth sinners, what a different view of the universe that gives us. God is for us, not against us. And even though life is full of hard things, we need them to knock us into shape. In the beginning was the Word. His God's thoughts made audible. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Just as the early verses of Genesis refute all kinds of heresies about the beginning of the world, including atheism, and agnosticism, and nihilism, and so on. These verses reject the many heresies about the nature of Christ. <coughs> Arianism says that Christ is a creature. Then there are all sorts of other views, Sabellianism, Eutychianism, Nestorianism. I won't bore you with those. But these verses answer all the heresies that have ever emerged on the nature of Christ and make it plain he is human altogether, but he's divine altogether. Just as much God as though not at all man, and just as much man as though not at all God. Through him all things were made. <clears throat> Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. So right at the beginning in this introductory section of verses 1 to 18, which is the introduction of the whole book, we have the main themes emerging that the book will deal with. It's going to present Christ as the light of the world and the life of the world. John's Gospel is like a series of paintings. Every chapter presents Christ in a different way. The first chapter of John's Gospel presents Christ as God the Son. The second chapter presents him as the human Christ. He goes to a wedding, and Jewish weddings didn't last a few hours, they could last a few weeks. So there we see the human Christ. In John 3, where he's with Nicodemus, we see the divine teacher. John 4, when he's with the woman of Samaria, who'd had a series of husbands and was living with a man that wasn't a husband, we see him as the soul winner. The next chapter he heals a man who's been sick for 40 years. Now we see him as the great physician. That's chapter 5. In chapter 6 he's the bread of life. In chapter 7 he's the water of life. In chapter 8 a woman is brought to him and they want him to command that she should be stoned because she's an adulteress. But he defends her because he's going to take her guilt and if she will trust in him, all her sins can be forgiven. So in chapter 8, he's the defender of the weak. And if you feel sometimes weak, he's your defender. In chapter 9, he's the light of the world. A man born blind is brought to him, and he gives him sight. Chapter 10, he's the good shepherd. We're the straying sheep, but he is the good shepherd. In chapter 11, he resurrects Lazarus because he is the resurrection and the life. And because we're dying, and because that's more certain than taxes, it's wonderful to know that our Lord is the resurrection and the life. In chapter 12, we see him as a king, triumphal entry. But in 13, we see him as a servant, washing his disciples' feet. And what a beautiful introduction in that chapter. Having loved his own that were in the world, he loved them unto the end. That is a tremendous verse. Having loved his own, that's you, that's me, that were in the world, tough place, he loved them unto the end. When you're down and when you're up, he loves you. So in 13, following the chapter that presents him as a king, now he's a servant. In 14, he's the consoler. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house, are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. 
If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. So here he is the great consoler and there's no human being that does not frequently need consolation. In 15 he's the true vine and we're united to him by faith. We're one with him in the reckoning of God. Despite our weaknesses, despite our follies, despite our sins, we're members of the true vine, accepted in the beloved, complete in him, no condemnation and no separation. So that's chapter 15. In chapter 16, he's the giver of the Spirit. When the Holy Spirit came down at Pentecost, he came to stay. He's as verily on earth today in this room as Christ was on the earth in the days of his flesh. The Holy Spirit came to stay. And he comes to dwell in every soul that accepts the good news, young or old, weak or strong, wise or foolish. So in chapter 16, he's the giver of the Spirit. The word used for the Spirit, the paraclete, means one called alongside to help. So we're never alone. Most people are very much afraid of loneliness. And <coughs> one of the problems about dying is that you, bore, you die you're alone. But the parakletos, one called alongside to help, is always with us. And if we understand that, we need never feel lonely and we need never feel inadequate. Life threatens us from all sorts of quarters. But if we understand the gift of the Spirit, that he's Christ's other self, but he's nearer than breathing, close than hands and feet. That's the message of chapter 16. In 17 we have Christ's prayer to the Father and here we see him as a great intercessor. He intercedes for us. He says, Father, they're mine. That's chapter 17. Chapter 18 where he's flogged again and again and again. He's the model sufferer. There's no stream of profanity <coughs> that comes from his mouth. If we have an accidental fall, you have to be quite mature. If you don't say something, you regret. <laughs> but we see in him the model sufferer. And although he's flogged time and time again, he utters no complaint. In chapter 19, he's the uplifted saviour. In chapter 20, he's the victor over death. In chapter 21, where he talks to Peter and asks him three times, because Peter had denied him three times, Lovest thou me? Here we see him as a restorer of the weak. So the Gospel of John is a series of paintings. Every chapter presents Christ from a different view. And it's very important we get to understand all of them. We need all of them. We're very incomplete. We're very weak. And all of us are often very foolish. We need Christ. We need God. We need the Holy Spirit. In him was life and the light was the light of men. Light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness. He's John the Baptist. He was not that light. He came to witness to it. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. In what sense is Christ the one who gives light to every man that comes into the world. Well, we're all made in the image of God. So, speaking as a generalisation, men have reason, men have conscience. To that degree, they have light. And a large proportion of the world has never heard of Jesus Christ, but they'll be judged by the light of conscience and reason. The fact that intuitively, they know that kindness is better than cruelty, that truth is better than error, that courage is better than cowardice. So even those who've not met Christ will be judged by the light that was given them when they came into the world. He was in the world and though the world was made by him, the world didn't recognise him. He came to that which his own was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. That's a marvellous verse, isn't it? Believing is receiving, receiving is believing. And when we believe, we become children of God. And it doesn't matter what other people think of you, God regards 